Welcome authorpreneur, speaker, social media consultant, Catherine McClatchy. Yay. Thank you. Glad to be here again. I will say, I think you're the first guest to actually do a three or a three time one. Like you've ever been on the podcast like three times. And that is amazing. And I love that. And I'm so happy that I'm like, what are your top guests? Oh, as yeah. Far as listens that that makes me just thrilled. Yeah. And I think I know I've mentioned it before, but if you're catching the podcast for the very first time, be sure to check out Catherine's other episodes because her episodes are usually my some of my more popular ones. Like the one for author productivity does amazingly well. I still get comments on that all the time from people. I love it. Fantastic. Especially if you're kicking off the year for 2023. Woo. We're in a new year now. Hello. Yeah. And it's going to be fabulous because we have so much more information than we did last year. And we have so many things to apply than we did last year. Exactly. And we are learning and we are growing. And one of the mottos with my community is we learn by doing, you know, I think so often we get stuck in this. If I fail, you know, I can't do anything right. And we beat ourselves up and, and we stop trying. I, I really encourage my people to try things. And if they fail, let's talk about what we learned from the process. Not that it was a failure. What, what did we learn? One of my favorite quotes, and I can't remember for the life of me who said it, it, it goes along the lines of, I have learned more from failing than I have from succeeding. Mm -hmm. And that is such a, that's something I hold so very close to my heart because I love, I'm so curious about a lot of things and I love to try things. Yeah. And if I, I figure if I fail, I will learn something from this one way or another, right? <laughs> yeah. And and I, I like the quote by Edison, you know, I now have a thousand ways not to make a light yeah. bulb. And, <laughs> and, you know, he didn't look at it like failure. He looked at it like, look what I've learned and how I can apply it to the next iteration. And, and I try to do that with both unleashing the next chapter with my brand, with my goal setting, with my coaching, with my social and digital media, you know, I'm in an industry that changes every six months. So I have to keep trying new things and experimenting. And I do the experimenting so I can go back to my clients and say, this is the best practice today. So in case listeners don't know, can you tell them a little bit about yourself and your business? I am Catherine McClatchy. I am a writer. I am a mom. I am a wife. I am a six-time stroke survivor. I have had to reinvent myself a number of times, and I have a service dog. And all of that contributed to making Unleashing the Next Chapter, which started as a blog in 2012, grew into a community in 2019, and a podcast in 2022 under the title of Authorpreneurs Unleashed. And we talk about all things business and demystifying the business of writing. And my writing has become more of a hobby as I found that I love coaching and helping authors promote their stories much more than I enjoyed actually writing my own. With so much going on that you have, I know we just kicked off a new year and it's time of year where people tend to set goals and plans for themselves. So no matter where authors are in their writing journey or their year, it's always a great idea to set like both writing goals and business goals since you do a little bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. um, so why are goals important for authors? I think goals are important for everybody, <laughs> um, not just authors, but I think since we're talking to authors and readers, um, it's important to set goals because that's how we improve. Um, I, I don't know who said it and multiple people have said it since, but you improve what you track. If you don't measure something, how do you know if you've improved in that area? And if this is important to you, if this is part of your values, you want to get better at that thing. My value is teaching and enlightening authors on how to market their books. So if I'm not measuring that, how do I know I'm doing better? Yeah. And that's such an important piece. How I am able to set goals for myself is like, are they measurable? Like the, I think it's called like the smart system. Yeah. And I've moved on to the smarter system. Oh, really? There's a smarter system? There's a smarter and a smartest. Actually, smartest came before smarter. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a few more components 
And I've added another one when I'm coaching people. But I also want to say what whenever you're listening to this, so this podcast is going to drop in January, but maybe you're listening to it next October. I have taken to setting quarterly goals because I find that sometimes things aren't even on my radar that are going to be important to me third quarter. Um, And I've read the book, the 12 week year, which I recommend a lot of people read. And it talks again about goals and breaking them down and measuring them, but also coming from an educational background and an academic background, working on a semester schedule, it became intuitive to me. So the 12 week year or the quarterly goal setting, I find is much more useful and successful than doing annual goals. So I'm just going to throw that out. I love that you've broken it down that way too, in a way that works for you. Mm -hmm. Because what I found most successful for me is that I love the quarterly kind of measure as well. That's what a lot of business do does, Mm -hmm. right? A lot Mm -hmm. of businesses will look by quarters. And of course, you're going to see more of Q4 because that's holiday season, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to see like more of a bump in Q4, especially if you're in retail, as opposed to Q1. So that's just the nature of the business. So, but for me in particular, I like to go by a a month by month basis, simply because I'm such a procrastinator. I'm so bad about it. I'm trying to be better. But if I wait for the three month mark, I'm going to wait to like the very end to do stuff. Well, that was exactly the whole point that was brought up in the book, The 12 Week Year. Um, What numerous studies of businesses have shown is that they set those annual goals, but nobody moves the needle on them until two months before the goal is due. Mm -hmm. So everybody jumps into gear and they found that if they could accomplish all of that in two to three months, then what are we doing the rest of the year? And by setting quarterly goals, they actually accomplished a whole lot more and people stayed focused much better. So I think as as a culture, um, we are having a trouble with fo- we are having trouble with focus. Period. By finding, you know, if a monthly goal works for you and that makes you comfortable, and you would rather set just one or two monthly goals, then yay, do that. I break it out kind of like a yearly goal of what I would like to achieve throughout the year versus Mm -hmm. and then try to break that down into little bite-sized pieces in order to make it more achievable, which is part of like the smart system, right? The smarter Mm -hmm. system Mm -hmm. is to make it achievable in that way. Okay. Since you've brought up the smart system, just in case our listeners aren't familiar, uh, let's make sure they are. So smart stands for there's multiple ways of looking at it so smart could be specific strategic and significant those are three words that are used for the s and i try to incorporate a lot of those things is this goal specific is it strategic is it going to take me to the next level or is it just a standalone and is it significant does it matter to my brand or does it matter to my core values um the m measurable meaningful motivational I think that's Mm. something a lot of people don't think of. Uh, We all talk about measurable goals. That is definitely important. But if it's not meaningful to you, are you going to do it? If it's not something that you're motivated to do or that motivates you to do other things, are you really going to do it? So let's start stacking a little bit more into these goals than just, you know, I want to read 52 books this year. Is it attainable? I think a lot of time people make goals in January after having a lot of champagne the night before and they don't look at the logistics. Um, You know, if it's not something that's humanly attainable or not attainable in your current world, you might want to think about that. Again, achievable is another word. I like adjustable and that's part Mm. of quarterly goals. You know, if you break it down and you find at the end of Q2 that okay, this isn't working for me the way I thought it would, or there's things that have come into my life that weren't there in January when I set the goal. How can I adjust this? And then is it agreed upon? Do you have a team or accountability partner or, um, you know, somebody in your life that can agree with you that this is a good goal and help you work towards it? I think that's important too. The R uh, stands for either relevant or realistic or results driven. You, if you don't know the outcome that you want for this goal, if you don't have a definition of success, how do you know what the results are that you're working towards? T, timely and trackable. 
So it has to be something that has an end date on it. You know, in six months, I will accomplish whatever. Uh, if it's not uh, time bound or timely, it's not relevant to this time period of your life or the season of your life. I think a lot of us set goals because they sound good or somebody in the industry that we admire has this goal. But you got to look at your season of life. If you just brought home a brand spanking new baby, kind of all other goals, in my opinion, are off the table because you got to focus on being a mom and getting sleep and finding a time to shower. Those are your priorities and your goals. Let's not worry about the rest. So consider the season of life. Then for smarter, um, the additional is E. Is it ethical? Does it align with your core values? Again, a lot of times we hear people we admire setting goals and it sounds good and it got them to the level we want to get to. But if it doesn't match up with your value system, you're going to procrastinate. You're going to drag your feet. You're going to sabotage your own efforts because it doesn't feel like you. Uh, e is also stood for evaluate. As you go, either monthly, quarterly, whatever, evaluate your wins, losses, lessons, growth. Make sure you're kind of thinking through this and not just kind of going automaton. And then the R stands for recorded. Make them public. Throw your hat over the fence. Post it on social media. Let people know that this is a goal because um, that's going to help you get it. And then don't be afraid to readjust. Again, adjustable. If, if something comes up in your life, you need to adjust. For instance, I started my podcast in July of last year. Well, that wasn't even on my radar in January. I didn't even know that that was a thing I wanted to do or that I had resources to help me do it or people in my world who would coach me. I Obviously, it wasn't a goal. But when it came on the radar and was made a goal, I had to readjust some of my other goals because they weren't as high a priority anymore. Well, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that because my podcast goals for last year evolved. Mm -hmm. Like as the year was going on, my original goal is when I started out in January of last year, I had one podcast episode. By February, I had one as well. And I was trying to get up to two. I was like, okay, I want to hit two podcast episodes a month. By May, that completely shifted. And I was doing one like basically weekly. And I started like doing one in like July, around July, because I saw all my podcast guests just kind of the schedule just started blowing up. <laughs> yeah. So around June or July timeframe, I started getting like almost weekly guests and I was only taking off really for holidays up until all the way up until around November. So like I had a solid almost six months worth of podcast weekly, which was huge for me. And I had really had to reassess some of those goals back in like May, almost like a quarterly time frame, mm -hmm. what you were talking about, because that direction had kind of just taken off on its own and kind of evolved. What is an important piece in trying to set the right goals? Because I think you had mentioned it before, is that sometimes people have a little too much to drink on New Year's. And I've, I've also heard the psychology of like, we let things go by for a long, long time. And then all of a sudden we want to fix it and we want an yes. instant fix. Yes. Um, I think the foundation is again, making sure everything aligns with your core goals and knowing why you want to do this. It's got to be deeper than it sounds good, or it will make me money. Um, one of the coaches I I've worked with made me ask, ask me why like five times. For everything I said, why? And then the answer to that, why? And then the answer to that, why? And so for instance, um, one of my goals was to earn X dollars from my business. And why? Because I want to buy a house. Why? Because I want to be independent. Why? And by the time the whys came down, I was like in tears because she got to the core of what I really wanted. And it had nothing to do with the money. You know, mm -hmm. so so that helped me kind of fine tune. And then when I get to where um, I don't want to do the thing, you know, because there's work involved in goals, you know, and some days you just don't want to do the work. But if you know your why and your why is tied into your core, then you can't help not to do the things. That's a great way of, of looking at it, too. And I like it that sometimes we had talked about it before, I think, on another podcast is making those goals achievable or at least putting them in a tiered system oh, to yeah. where 
So, so we have one level of goals that you know you can hit, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have another level that you actually have to work for if you're going to make it and then have a stretch goal that if all those planets and stars align and everybody in your world helps, you know, focus you, you can reach that stretch goal. And um, I think it's always good to have something to shoot for. I have a plaque actually, I keep right behind me, that I've had since I was a teenager. I think my grandmother bought it because I was ooing and aahing over it. But it says, climb high, climb far. Your goal is the sky. Your aim, the stars. You always shoot your goal higher than what you need. So if you don't get that stretch goal, you by aiming for it, you certainly get the things below it that you really wanted. Oh, that's very sweet. And I think that's a, there's also a Marilyn Monroe quote where she says, uh, shoot for the moon. If you miss, you land among the stars. Yeah. Yeah. Same theory. So I think, you know, sometimes we set our goals too low because we're afraid of failure. And I would really like people to start rethinking. It's not failure. It's what did you learn that will help you next time? And maybe what you learned was that goal wasn't as important to you as you thought it was. Or sometimes I think that that happens as well. But I think also on the flip side, there are people who start their goals out the stretch goals, right? Mm-hmm. Like they set themselves too high, the bar so high to where it's not achievable. Like I want to lose like 20, 20 pounds in a month. And it's like, but. Is that humanly <laughs> logistically possible in your per- current setting? Yeah. What do you, so yeah, some people can do that, but what do they have to do? They have to change the world. Do they have to go away? Do they have to, you know, do they have to do extreme things to get it? And are they willing to do it? And are they able to do that in their current financial situation or family situation? So I think there's, there's more involved to be successful in your goal setting than just saying, oh, that sounds like a cool goal. Exactly. And I think that's such a, a great faceted way of looking at it is like, where are you in your life? Where are you in your journey as far as a writer or a reader? Are you just starting your reading blog? Like you want to be a reviewer and you're just kind of starting out at the basics. Like how often do you read right now currently? And if you're a writer, how how often are you writing? And that goes back to the measurable part. If you don't mm-hmm. measure your baseline, how do you know if you improve on it? Right. So you got to start somewhere. I also would like to throw out the idea that you can set your calendar for your business anytime you want. A lot of businesses run like October to uh, September. It doesn't have to match up with January to December. So if, again, you're hearing this at a different time, there's no reason why you can't start a new goal path at this point. You don't have to wait for January. Well, yeah, most retail calendars, almost all retail calendars will start from like February to January. Yeah. And that's just that because they're they're not going to miss their peak time of year, which is holiday. Yeah. So, like, so look at your calendar, right? See, you know, if you're planning a big wedding or something in June, well, you don't need to be doing other things then, right? You need to look at what your focus is going to be in that month. Exactly. Like I very recently became a foster mom kind of abruptly in November. So (laughs) yay. So the podcast had to take a backseat to that, right? That's just the nature of how things went because it wasn't really on my radar as a goal at that moment. And because your core value was family before business. Yes. So again, you have to be able to readjust or adjust based on, again, if you don't know your core values first, it's really hard to set applicable goals. And you know what? I was still so thrilled with how my goals were had shaped up last year that honestly, when I took a break, I wasn't mad. I wasn't mad no. at all about it. And I was just like, you know what? I did really good. I went from, I think I started out from 16 episodes to by the time I finished like 41. So like that was a lot of episodes I was able to put out in the span of what, maybe about 10 months. Yeah. So that was awesome. I was absolutely- And they were quality- just- episodes exactly you know and and again core values are you looking for numbers or are you looking for quality ideally we get both but you know what's that saying um you can have it fast you can have it cheap or you can have a good pick two mm-hmm. and i think that's important to realize too we may not hit like all of our goals or hit all the measures we're looking at but seeing how far you come to by that by a certain point like you said like doing reassessing like quarterly mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. that it shows progress. And I think that's a lot of thing that deters people is when you don't see that progress. Well, and again, looking at, um, you know, we change and we evolve as humans. Um, so there's some things I, I also think it's important to dream and I have a 10 year dream and I also subscribe. I think Stephen Covey talked about it back in the eighties. Um, Donald Miller in his new book, hero on a mission talks about starting with your eulogy. Imagine what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? Start there, mm-hmm. work backwards. And then, um, and, and that's more about who you are as a person not so much what you've accomplished, I think, in eulogies. You never hear children going up to the, you know, front of the church and talking about how their dad was such a titan of industry and spent all of his hours developing, you know, whatever little thing. They talk about him taking them fishing and, you know, the family trips and and being there for him. Um, so think about what you want people to say at your funeral. Figure out your core values and then come up with a 10-year dream, you know, if, if money was no object, if um, time was not an issue, what would you really, really like? And come up with, I think a lot of us are afraid to dream. And that's silly because we're authors and we spend our life with our daydreams and our imaginary <laughs> friends. But when it comes to what we want out of life, um, either life has knocked us down so many times or we were told we need to. I, I know a lot of writers who were told they had to get a degree in something that would pay the bills and be realistic. You know, writing isn't realistic. But um, the fact is, we need to be free to dream and figure out who we want to be and then, you know, break it down. What's realistic? What's a what's a five year goal? What's a one year goal? What's a one quarter goal? What's a one month goal? Break it down. So, and that's a really great piece of advice. So how do you suggest, is that the best way you suggest going about like creating a plan of action towards your goals is breaking them up into those small pieces? Because that's how I found it worked best for me at least. Right. So there's a difference between, um, and, and the military talks about this a lot. There's a difference between goals and there's a difference between objectives. So what's your goal? And what's your objective? Those are two separate things. And too often we use them synonymously. Um, And then the other thing is looking at strategies and tactics. Those are also different. So yeah, a goal, you want to look at the big picture. It's kind of, if you imagine a triangle, right? We all know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So think of a similar triangle. At the top, you have your goal. This is what the way I will be. This is the end right? But underneath that, you have objectives. What do you need to do to bring this goal to life? So using the weight loss thing, if I want to lose 25 pounds, that's the overall goal. Hopefully I know why and what my motivation is. We've already talked about that, but then what are the objectives? How am I going to do this? Am I going to use intermittent fasting? Am I going to exercise more? Am I going to go vegan for six months? You know, what, what objectives are there and then you can break those objectives even down to strategies what are the strategies i'm going to use i'm not going to bring junk food into the house i'm not going to go out with my friends who will be drinking all weekend because i don't need those extra calories you know whatever the strategies are that you can use and then tactics are a little more um short term this is what I'm doing in this situation. So if you know that you're going to have to go to a birthday party and there's going to be a lot of your favorite foods there, what are the tactics you're going to use in that specific situation? I think oftentimes we create goals, but we don't come up with the tools that we need to help accomplish those goals. And if you can think through not just goal setting, but the objectives, the strategies, and the tactics, you're more likely to be successful in that goal. And how would you define success? That is personal for everybody. Okay. So again, that comes back to your core values, right? If your core value is all about making money, then maybe the dollar sign is the mark of success and how you keep score. If, um, if you want to lose weight, why, you know, is it because you want to be healthier? Is it because you find that you can't keep up with your kids and you really want to spend quality time doing the fun mom stuff? Um, or is it simply because you want to look good in a new dress for an upcoming event? Um, 
really think about why you want these goals and then figure out what the measure of success is that's relevant to that goal. If it's fitting in the new dress, that's success. Woohoo. It doesn't matter what the scale says. Sometimes your your objectives, your tactics will also be dependent on what your definition of success is. Like say for a writer, it might be writing at least like the first draft, right? Finishing that first draft. Right. So if if drafting is where you've been stuck or the next step in your journey, then maybe you need a word count goal for the day, the week, the month. You know, if you only write on Saturdays, well, then you need to set a word count for the month. So word counts are useful, keeping an Excel spreadsheet or a chart on the wall or, you know, an old wall calendar that you put up. That's how I got through NaNoWriMo. Um, I put a calendar on my door of my office and I put where my word count should be for each day of November. And then I literally give myself a gold star if I meet the goal or if I get a hold of the goal. And the door is where everybody in the house walks by. So my husband and my sons and whoever else can look at the calendar and know if I'm on track or not and can help encourage me to get in there and write. So set yourself up for success, but know what success means. If it's a finished product that you're looking at, then your your goal is going to be broken down differently and your measure of success is going to be is it published not so much the word count but the publishing because there's a lot more that goes into that you're talking about editors and cover design and beta readers and launches so that's a different measure of success and I love how you mentioned like how you were tracking it for NaNoWriMo so like are there any other methods you use to track it because I know Shayla was actually talking about writing it down each day kind of like you were mentioning in like a notebook though that works too and I've done that also I I use a I'm not a serious bullet journaler but I do have a, a journal that goes with me everywhere and I have learned that um, reviewing my goals, actually, uh, now that we talked, and I know, I, I don't know if you're putting this up on YouTube or if it's just for the podcast, but I'm going to show it anyways. So for 2022, I had my word of the day, my Bible verse that I focus on every year. And then the very next page is my goals. And I typed them out and I put them in with washi tape and then my eulogy. So my eulogy, I've already written out. And I revise it every year. I tweak it a little bit. I write notes on it during the year. But I look at this every so often, um, maybe weekly, as I'm kind of refocusing. Here's my goals. This is what I said I want to accomplish. Here's my eulogy. This is why I want to do these things. And then I break it down. I have a quarterly page. So I have my quarterly and I break it down with a Kanban and with the calendar so I can look at it. And here's how I break down what I'm doing that quarter that's going to help me reach the next stage. And um, I've kept writing logs in here. I've kept reading logs in here because those are essential components. And I've also kept money maps in there um, because money is a way to keep score if you're doing business and if that's part of a goal. Um, For me, money is not the end goal, but it is a way of keeping score to seeing how close I am getting to my end goal. I love that you do that too, because that is something that I have started to do to kind of see where my costs are coming from and where I can utilize some that costs somewhere else. Like if I want to start my author journey as in like a logo, like I had a logo creation earlier this year, like in 2022, I had, um, I reached out to the graphic designer I had actually interviewed and she created my logo and my brand for me. So yeah. So I went ahead and kind of siphoned money off into there. And now I'm starting to calculate, okay, if I realistically want to go down the author path, the indie author path, then what do I need for it and how can I budget for that? Exactly. And if you don't know what the costs are ahead of time, it's really hard to budget it and it's also hard to prioritize it. I mm-hmm. think that's something that we often forget about is, you you know, we're told as women, you can do everything you want to do. You can be everything you want to be. Well, yes, you can, but not all in this month, right? Okay. I look at the Proverbs 31 woman. She did all these amazing things, but this was the course of her life. You know, if you're in the season of life where you're raising babies, that is your priority period. End of story, right? 
you had babies, you got to raise babies. Everything else is lower priority because you got to mm -hmm. keep these little monsters alive. So, you know, but at a different stage, I'm an empty nester now. Um, my babies are taking care of themselves and hopefully going to have their own babies, right? So not a priority. So this is the stage of life where I get to have a book baby or a business baby or, you know, focus on we're going to be moving in a few months. That's where my focus and my priorities are. And if you're moving in the next couple of months, you're going to readjust your goals probably, right? And Within my that budget. Time yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it all wraps around each other, right? We don't live in isolation and our goals don't live in isolation. So we got to think what else is going on and how does this affect the people we love? Because if your spouse isn't on board with your goals, um, that's a different conversation. Uh, for mm -hmm. better or for worse, you know, so maybe it's, I use my husband as a sounding board. And if he has a problem, and, and I'm blessed, uh, my husband almost never says no. So when he does, I know to listen and pay attention, because there's something I missed and something I need to understand here. Um, because he loves to see me succeed. I, I'm blessed. And I know this. Um, but there's, there's moments when I know that I need somebody else to kind of look over this and make sure I didn't miss anything. And that's why you have accountability partners. I have, a, as far as my business goes, Jessica White and I are accountability partners. We meet every week. We brainstorm together. We double check each other. She's really good about asking me, Catherine, where are you going to put this on your calendar? Because I can come up with great ideas, but the logistics are, you know, I need somebody to get in my face and say, where will this go on your calendar? You know, um, and and that's been really useful for me. And you and I working together with the podcasting, you know, uh, seeing your number, seeing what you've learned helped me develop my goals. So I wasn't working in isolation. I had somebody I could call and say, hey, what does this mean? Or what do I do next? Um, I think we need people that um, not only have gone before us, but that we can coach coming behind us. That's such a great method too of like learning where you can, where your trajectory can go as mm -hmm. far as your goals. Because yeah, when you started the podcast, so speaking of goals, like when you started the podcast, you didn't expect like right out the gate to get 10,000 downloads, right? Oh my goodness. Because I looked at your numbers and I saw, okay, this is doable. This is what Sarah did. So yes. this gives me a realistic frame of reference. Because if you're just watching, you know, the, the gurus out there, they're the ones that are the outliers and the rock stars. And it's not realistic to set your goals there. Just like as authors, you can't compare your debut novel with a bestseller's 30th novel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not the same playing field. And they have a support structure and systems and workflows in place that you don't even know about yet. So um, I think all of that is really important when it comes to setting up your goals, your objectives, your strategies. Like that's something we actually talked about in the part two episode yes. with us, with, with branding. <laughs> we recorded part two before part one. So forgive us. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. We were, we were just kind of going with the flow there, but we talked about it in branding that you want to find, it's such a big part of the industry standard, especially in the entertainment industry, whether you come from publishing or I believe movies do this as well. From what I understand, I know games do this. You want to find a comparable title to your, to yours. Mm -hmm. Like you want to mm -hmm. find a comparable um, book to your book, especially with an author that's very similar to you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. The same thing I would think kind of applies to goals. You want to find something that's comparable to where you are. And maybe I know a lot of authors will post what their goals are, right, for the year. And sometimes, like you said, find the accountability partners. Yes. Find your network and ask them, what are your goals? What's it been achievable for you? And maybe from there, you can kind of structure your own goals that what's important to you. I love to reading biographies for this very reason, mm. um, you know, people who have accomplished great things in your industry, your field, whatever. Um, I, I think everybody's read Stephen King on writing. That's, yeah. that's it. Right. <laughs> uh, but, but I didn't quite connect with him, his values, his, the way he did things. And again, I'm not a man with that setup. You know, my world didn't revolve the way his did, mm -hmm. but then I read, Kitchen Privileges by Mary Higgins Clark. But Mary Higgins Clark started writing as a widow with five children and a day job in a marketing industry. And she wrote every morning 
before her kids woke up. And that's how she got started. And the things that she learned along the way and the little tips and techniques and attitudes that she wrote about in that book were so very, very useful to me. That connected with me. I had a um, similar situation when I started writing. I had kids at home. I was trying to juggle all the things. I, I wasn't a widow, but um, you know, I had a job and I was doing so much that my writing couldn't be the number one focus the way it was for Stephen King. So that one connected with me more and I was able to get some some goals and some tips and some suggestions from that that applied. Well, and that's such a great thing to remember because most authors have a full-time job and a lot mm -hmm. of them are also parents. Uh -huh. So there, it, it is hard to find that time in writing, but you can find it. Yeah. And some, again, my background being Victorian literature, some of the most prolific authors of the Victorian era were also working other jobs. Dickens was essentially a court reporter when he started writing. Uh, I believe was it Trollope, who was a bank clerk and another one worked for the mail system. I mean, some of these giants of literature from the Victorian era, they were not writing full time, nor and did they have computers or Google. <laughs> So again, there's ways to do things. And I think we learn a lot by looking at other people's processes, but we also have to make sure that we're realistically understanding where they are in their life, what skills they already have, what systems and workflows and community they're working within. Um, you know, Dickens and uh, Ainsworth and Bulwer-Lytton and Forrester, they would go out to the hunting lodge and work for months at a time. And they would write in the morning, they would ride horses and um, edit in the afternoon. And at night after dinner, they would sit together in front of the fireplace and critique each other's work. You know, So if you have a system like that in place, your goals are gonna be very different than somebody who's working all by herself after the kids go to sleep and after she's worked a full-time job already that day. And so how do you find like what time frames work effectively for what the goals you want to set? Do you have to find that baseline kind of first, right? I think you start with your baseline. What are you okay. already doing? Um, and then, you know, maybe the first year you set a goal, if it's one of those things that are on your 10-year dream list and you're working towards, maybe you set that goal and you hold it loosely in that you're working towards it, but you're not going to beat yourself up if you succeed or fail, because it's a learning year, you know, you learn, okay, this worked, but this didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, I had Crohn's disease. I, I have, it's a lifelong thing, but it took a lot of trial and error to figure out that a vegan diet makes me asymptomatic. I tried every diet. I tried drugs. They were getting ready to do surgery to remove many feet of my colon. And, um, and a friend of mine suggested going vegetarian. And then I found out I felt so much better. And then I ate meat and then I was back in the hospital and we had to play with this a little bit. So I'm using this as an illustration. You know, I didn't beat myself up because I failed. It was part of the learning process. And then the next year I figured out I need to be vegan. Um, the next year was learning how to do that. And there was a lot of trial and error again, but I had, a, I had knowledge going in. So every year that gets better and better because I now know what works. I now know what products are available. I now know who to follow to get good recipes, you know? So I think our goal setting for writing should follow the same traje trajectory. If you're just starting as a writer, let's start with a lot of experimentation. Maybe your goal, rather than writing so many words, is your goal is to try the Pomodoro method one month and see how many words you write. And then your goal is to try another technique another month, see how many goal words you write. And just use that as an experiment rather than a hard and fast goal. I got to hit, you know, 50,000 words in a month. It's like finding what method works for you and then mm -hmm. leaning into it as opposed mm -hmm. to just leaning in blindly into a method that you don't know if will or will not work. Right. And then there's at the other end of the spectrum, we have these writers who've been published. I know a lot of romance writers are writing three, four, five books a year, okay. which just blows yes. my mind, yes. but they're doing it. Um, so they have a new baseline, right? They're at a different place in their career. They have systems and workflows put together, but I still believe it's valuable to continue experimenting and learning and seeing how we can fine tune the system, how we can be more efficient, how we can write better quality, how we can um, 
hire somebody to del and delegate the things that don't bring us joy so that we can spend more time doing the things that we are gifted at. Uh, only you can draft and write your stories, but you can delegate some other things to give you more time to write your stories. You know, if if hiring a housekeeper makes your life feel better and smell better and you have more joy knowing that your kitchen, you know, you're not sticking to the floor as you walk through it, that gives you more peace to write. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's what we're looking at right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I worked with a, a business coach and I was getting ready to, st I was at the point where I needed to hire somebody on my team because I, I couldn't keep up with the work. And she looked at me and she said, what in your life causes you the most stress? And without a beat, I said, housekeeping. I hate housekeeping and it stresses me out when it's mm. not done. I can't focus when my house isn't in order and it makes me feel yes. guilty that I'm not taking care of my husband, you know, all the, mm -hmm. all the stupid things you think of. And uh, she's like, so what's stopping you from hiring a housekeeper? And I'm like, well, that won't advance my business. And she looked at me and she said, want to bet? I'm telling you what, getting a housekeeper in every other week has been the best business decision I've ever made. Yeah. And that's something we're currently looking at too, to kind of do like the like detailed things, mm -hmm. like, right. Like I can get the big things, but then that'll help me so much. I think get like, like you said, just a weight lifted off your shoulders mm -hmm. so that you have more time to do other things. And the you... things that nobody else can do, right? Yes. Nobody else can be a mother to your kid. Nobody else can write your stories. You need to focus on the things that nobody else can do that you can do and then get better at those things. Uh, I wanted to say too, that if you're just starting out and you don't have the budget to hire either the housekeeper or the um, social media manager or the editor or whatever, figure out how to barter. You can always barter and there is always somebody willing to barter with you. So when I was a young mom trying to figure out all the things, uh, there was another young mom in my Sunday school class that lived two blocks away that had kids the exact same age as I did. She loved to do all the party planning and all the fun things and cook extra meals for people. Um, I loved being able to take the kids to the park and go do things, you know, uh, run errands, take them to classes, whatever. So we figured out a couple of days a week, she watched all the kids and I did all the grocery shopping for both families. And then I had a day where I did all the things with the kids and she did all the, you know, frou-frou things that she enjoyed doing. And there was another friend that we double teamed laundry day, you know, so somebody's watching and the kids are playing, the kids are having a great time, they're toddlers. And, and that's how we were able to manage being stay-at-home moms with our budget and getting the things done we wanted to do, plus the things we had to do. I love that you were able to like help tag team because I know that there are there are resources out there that people can pull from their own networks and mm -hmm. find like either friends, family, or even church members who are willing to kind of like trade with that. My dad still does that. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to lie. Yeah. Still, he always finds an older single lady and he's like, listen, I can't pay the full rent. I could pay you half, but I will work to like clean up your entire, he can make a lawn look spectacular. I'll do your hard <laughs> work in exchange. Exactly. exactly. And the same thing That's applies in the writing field, you know, um, authors, there is no reason that you have to do everything you hate doing. So if you're really good at writing copy and you can, um, do some of the more creative sides of, of business, but bookkeeping is your nemesis, then find a bookkeeper who needs somebody to write copy for their social media and do some graphics for them and barter it out. That's how um, I work with my uh, podcast producer. We're bartering some skills. I'm, I'm paying a little bit, but I'm not paying her nearly what she's worth because I'm, I have some skills that she needs and wants. So find somebody that can work um, in community with you that you can have a win-win situation and you can do that all the way through your career. And we've done that. Mm -hmm. We've done that also, like just trying to tap each other for that knowledge and trying mm -hmm. to get like that coaching and those uh, skills and services from each other just right. so that we can kind of spread it around. And that's so important with, with accomplishing goals, because if you don't have a community that can support you, encourage you, um, keep you focused, you're not going to reach your goals as successfully or as peacefully. I, peace is a value. I need peace in my life and I am not going to stress over the small <laughs> stuff. I have lived through six strokes and, and heart surgery before I was 50. So I'm here to tell you, 
I've done the big things. I know what's life and death and this ain't it. Well, and I love that you mentioned that because goals are not meant to be stressful. That's mm-hmm. not the point of setting goals and trying to achieve them. They're supposed to be there to amplify, right? Yeah. Amplify your skills or your life, not to make it more stressful. Right, right. And and in my world, um, my goals are to help me find more efficient and effective ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. So if I'm finding that this experiment is stressful, then it's the wrong goal, the wrong track tactic the wrong whatever um and i live uh, tim ferris talks about this in his uh either one of his books i i can't remember which one but his life is an experiment he just figures out these big things he wants to learn and then he does a big experiment and he uses himself as the guinea pig and then he writes about it and sells a gazillion books talking about how he did the thing he's done that with learning languages he's done that with the four-day work week he did that with i think like diet and bodybuilding type stuff Mm. um he just keeps setting different things that he's fascinated with and then figuring out the how to get to the top of the field And then he writes, okay, this is what worked for me. This is what I learned in the process. These are things you want to try. So I think there's a lot of value in experimenting and and finding the lessons learned in the process of getting those goals accomplished. Yeah. And if nothing else, that is like, I think a key to helping you figure out what are the right goals for you and how do Mm -hmm. I achieve those? Mm-hmm. And it's also great to blog about, right? If oh, you're yeah. looking for content <laughs> ideas or social media stories or whatever, uh, you know, do the thing. If you're learning a new language or if you're learning, you know, you're um, – I I went deep dive into linguistics and forensic linguistics because I was writing a story where my main character was a disabled uh, FBI agent who was now working in the linguistics field. And man, I learned more than I thought possible about that. Um, So, you know, if if that's something you're learning, blog about it, write content about it, add a, a factoid in your newsletters, you know, um, your audience, again, if they're loving your stories, they're going to want to know the journey you went on to get to that story. Such a, a great thing to take with you as an author, right? You still have that knowledge base, if nothing else, you know? And I always like to think of goals too, as uh, investing in myself more than stuff. You can lose stuff. You can't lose, well, if you stroke, you can lose knowledge and abilities. But um, for the most part, what you've learned goes with you no matter your situation. And you can apply knowledge to any situation. And you can apply that knowledge in places you didn't think to put it before. Like I love color coordinating Mm -hmm. everything. And now that's how I've been structuring when I set goals for myself or my calendar. Like I color coordinate things so I can just visually look at, because I'm so visual oriented. You know, you're talking my language, I know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, like that's how I know that like, okay, so I set a a monthly goal. So it's like a red, it's in the red, right? Or if I set a a quarterly goal, it's in the green, things like that. Like, or things I know are related to the podcast, maybe they're yellow, things like that. Like I can easily Mm -hmm. like just visually look at it and know exactly what it's for and what I need to be doing, like at least for that month, right? Or the week. Well, I learned that as study skills, you know, back in the olden days, uh, when I was a student before computers, because it's easier to search through your notes for a color that you didn't have the Google search bar, right? You couldn't go to your drive and search for or your emails and search for it was all on paper. So if you highlighted certain colors, you could find it faster. And I've taken that with me. I have five parts of my life. You know, some people live the round 10 kind of lifestyle, whatever, I break my life up into five categories and each category is assigned a color. And it doesn't matter if I'm on the computer or if I'm on my bullet journal, or if I'm taking notes on something else, those five colors, I know exactly what topic I'm writing about and what I'm looking for when I need to find something. Well, and I had a girlfriend who actually told me one of the speakers she went to, Marjorie Lawson, who actually talked about structuring out your book like that and how you write like Mm -hmm. in those kind of segmented ways of like color coding where she was talking about, well, go through your book and, or draft, it was your draft really, and start like highlighting what's plot driven. Now use a different color for what's character driven. Now use another color for what's setting driven. And then you can see like visually where you're heavier. 
in Aries. So I write in Scrivener and Scrivener yeah. gives you the you ability do. to color code and tag things. And so I do color coding for my main, my female main character is one color. My male main character is another. My villain is another. And I, and I have a different color system for, cause I like interleaving um, the time periods. I think that's just cool to jump from time periods, but I want it balanced. So I have different colors for different time periods. And that way I can visually look at all my note cards and go, okay, I need to write something next for this character in this time period because we're off balance. And it's such a great system. And we both know, obviously it works for us. Mm -hmm. So like, it's again, so that's great. the key. Find something yes. that works for you. Exactly. And don't be afraid to adjust and tweak it. And I actually, like I said, I learned that in a way I didn't expect. I like to co color coordinate my email and it always made it so easy if someone like, say I was out for a little, for a period of time, like a couple mm -hmm. of days, mm -hmm. it was easy for someone to jump in my spot and know exactly where I was in my emails. Um, so I realized that I could apply that in other places like my scheduling, just regular scheduling throughout my, my calendar and writing eventually. I use Google Calendar. And yes, everything is, uh, you can set up multiple calendars within one, like sub calendars. So I have a sub calendar that matches the color for my business. I have a sub calendar that matches the color for my family and relationships. I have a sub calendar that matches all these things. And again, it's, um, it's helps with prioritizing. I am not one that believes you have to have a balanced lifestyle because I think the balance is dependent upon what season of life you're in and what your goals and objectives are. So for me, it's okay that there's a lot of green on there because that's my work and I enjoy my work. And it's okay that um, there's not so much of the blue because I don't like housekeeping. <laughs> And I think that is so important. And that's something I have also looked into doing. So I completely relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so pick colors, you know, what's important to you. Number one, going back to those core values for me, it's, it's my profession is important. My faith is important. My family's important. Um, you know, my, my hobbies are important. Uh, so relationships with friends, these are the things that I value. So these are the things that I color code and I make sure, you know, if my calendar shows I haven't uh, whatever color is assigned to friends. Um, if I have a short on that on a week, I know I need to add more girlfriend time or I need to check in with people because that's not only one of my values, but that gives me strength to keep going, to have those relationships and to know that my people are doing okay. So you have given some amazing recommendations for content that authors or readers can utilize to level up their craft or their business strategy, or even just writing goals. So what kind of other content do you suggest for any authors or reading readers looking to smash those goals? Uh, I always go back to The Power of When by Michael Bruce B-R-E-U-S, the power of when. If you don't know your chronotype and when you are most uh, productive and efficient and healthy during your day, you need to check this out. He also has a quick quiz that you can do, the power of when dot com go there and it'll link you to a quiz but i strongly recommend you read that book and figure out you your uh, family members your boss whatever it, it changed my life another book that i highly recommend is the 12 week year by brian moran and michael lennington uh, they've also come out with the 12 week year for writers and that talks about breaking down your goals and getting your writing done the 12 week year is a little more on the corporate side but i think that's a huge game changer and then again i'm going to mention i already said hero on a mission by donald miller he takes the idea of goal setting and building your life and he uh, he tells it in relation to the hero's journey that most of us as writers are familiar with the, the hero's journey. Um, so the way he explains how to figure out your life's mission and how to set goals really clicked with me. So I think those are great resources. Again, um, don't be afraid to dream big. In 2020, Mel Robbins did the best decade ever and the dream big and those uh, YouTube uh, and podcasts are still out there and she's releasing a new 
Um, I think it's an Audible exclusive right now with Mel Robbins, Reinvent Your Life. And there's a lot of useful um, mindset things in there, as well as practical goal setting things in there. So those are really great resources that I would look at. And again, if you're looking at uh, outsourcing or delegating your social media or digital media, I do that. I'd love to visit with you. Um, I also coach authors on building um, they're taking their writing from from writing to author to being an authorpreneur. So if you are looking at leveling up in 2023 and learning more about the business of writing, I would love for you to talk to me about private coaching. Or if that's not in your budget yet, listen to my podcast, Authorpreneurs Unleashed. And every week we talk about a different aspect of building your author business. And we actually did a a part two that we kind of mentioned in the podcast earlier um, centered around branding. Yes, yes. For the Um, podcast. So be sure to check that out. Yeah. And we've got another surprise for your listeners. Yes. And so we're also going to do a giveaway, right? And the details are if you are a follower, you have to like and comment, correct, on our post? Great. Okay, if you are already a follower of the podcast, now if you are not a follower and you want to join our following, we will automatically enter you into the giveaway uh, once you do follow us. Correct. And so you would, if you're a new follower, you have multiple opportunities. You can do the follow and you can do a like comment or tag somebody. Maybe you have a writer friend that you would like to recommend our podcast to feel free to do that. We would love our goals, Sarah and my goals um, for our podcast is to grow our following and to get more ratings. And um, we want to serve more people and share what we've learned on our journey. Right. And so uh, it'll go till the end of February. That's when we were, we were going to um, find the winner. That's when we're going to select February, 2023, in case you're listening to this in the future. Exactly. So February, 2023 (laughs) um, is when we will select a winner and uh, Catherine is giving away a one hour uh, social media audit. A live social media audit. Okay. Uh, And I will be giving away a, I will tell you in the beginning of the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) So I once I have um, firm confirmation on what I can do for a giveaway, because right now I'm in discussion with one of the guests of the podcast to possibly give away one of their services. But Catherine, where can people find your services, can find you and your podcast? So my podcast is Authorpreneurs Unleashed. And I have hashtagged Authorpreneur Unleashed on pretty much every platform. I am on uh Yeah, pretty much every platform because I'm a social media consultant. So I got to be there. And my social media is very hit or miss because like I said, I do a lot of experimenting and I try out different things and I do, uh, I step back from social media so I can start fresh with, with numbers and try things so that I can bring my best practices to my clients. Um, you can also find me at unleashingthenextchapter.com, but I warn you, I am rebuilding my website. So if it looks like it's down, it's a temporary thing. And then if you want to email me, it's Catherine at unleashingthenextchapter.com. 